Okay, well, welcome. Thank you for coming to share this afternoon with Thank us. You. We are very honored that you came, and we have a nice intimate group to have a, a deep journey into the mind and come into a deep experience, because that's what we all want, is, is just an experience. And so, uh, Diana and I have flown in here from Salt Lake City, Utah, down to Big D. First time in some years since I've been down here, so it's great to be back again. And, um, yeah, we, we think we'll be able to have a, a very deep, profound gathering this afternoon. I think we will probably break around 2.15 or 2.30 just for refreshments. I know uh, Peter and Lisa have, have snacks set up over here. Some of you have seen that. There's restrooms that are back here behind us. And so we'll have a little uh, restroom break and a little snack break uh, in the middle of the afternoon before we continue and, and round it out. So how many of you are familiar with The Course in Miracles? Is everyone familiar? Okay, that's good. The whole group, 100%. <laughs> we enjoy coming upon invitation and it was actually quite a few years ago when uh, Peter contacted me. I think the first time we talked is you called me on the phone. About, what did you say, about 12 years ago? We had a lovely chat on the phone and then at some point uh, Peter sent an email just saying, well just remember Lisa and I down here in Dallas, if you ever get the call to come here, please keep it in mind. And I have an invitations folder that had, has lots and lots of invitations, so it was in there for sitting there for years. And then uh, I was just over in Australia, and my my mobile phone rang. It was Peter, and he was like, "What? What's your schedule look like?" <laughs> and I said, well, "Just." I'm just finishing a second world tour. I just did one over in, in Europe, and I just been to China, and Japan, and Australia. But I said, I will definitely keep it in mind when I come back. And then when I came back, it just, we had another beautiful call, and, and some email exchanges, and so it, it unfolded so effortlessly for us to come down here. And I uh, happened to have a companion flight, so I said to Diana, she'd like to come, and she said, oh yes. And she had a pretty severe sprained ankle at the time, and then she went through a miraculous healing, so she's 100%. <laughs> and that's another thing about miracles is they are, they start in the mind, they stay in the mind, they originate, but the world is a reflection of alignment. When we align with Source, when we align with Spirit and God, then the world reflects that. So that's, that was a nice little case of symptom removal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it was, because uh, um, when it happened, I, I was like, oh, something's gone wrong. And all I heard was like, oh, it's just a, uh, it's just, it's just an, an opportunity to experience a miracle, mm -hmm. and I didn't even want it to pray, what do I do with my leg? It was, um, what's inspiring, and, and I felt like, oh, I have to. <laughs> I felt like at a time I had some things to prepare for this for these gatherings, and I couldn't, I felt like nothing can stop me. Like, it's it's not something that's that's not negotiable. And I just went with it, and in that moment I can feel, just staying in that inspiration, that that was the miracle, and it's just, I, f I felt that it's gone, and it's just going to be the matter of, uh, not even time, that there's going to be an effect of it, just, um, and I heard that would be for teaching purposes, but that that's not even the miracle, like, you know, my, my ankle got healed just within, like, in the moment, so it felt... But I felt like the miracle was in the mind that it's it's just staying in that in that inspiration that was that was it that can really uh, like that sense of non compromise that nothing can like nothing can prevail the miracle like nothing can be stopped that was the real thing and everything got reflected really quickly so that was.
quite miraculous. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you could come with me. <laughs> it worked out very nice. I feel like when we go on this journey, we, we are so, we are also accustomed to looking to the world for uh, signposts and symbols and reflections. And I think we have a bit of a trace of that ego thinking where the ego had put the world as a projection just so we would get lost and caught up into these images. Hi there, welcome. Come on in on a rainy day, come out of the rain. And so much of the authentic spiritual journey is really loosening our mind from attachment to outcomes. Because when we consider those outcomes specific uh, forms, then we are attached to those specific forms and it's very upsetting and irritating and annoying when those forms come out in a different way than we had anticipated. So you might say that that's what the authentic spiritual journey is about, is just becoming so trusting, so intuitive, so internally guided and directed that you loosen from attachment in form outcomes. So you can let all things be exactly as they are, so you can just watch the world and behold the world without feeling that your emotions are on a roller coaster ride based on good outcomes and bad outcomes. But that takes a lot of, of mind training, it takes a lot of, of practice. We were having dinner last night and I, I shared that uh, on a recent uh, live television broadcast to uh, a lot of Latin American countries and the Spanish-speaking countries, uh, one of the questions was about discipline and why do we so associate discipline uh, with a, a negative experience? Why do we have a, a negative connotation with the word discipline? Because if we're honest, there's all kinds of things in this world that require discipline. To pretty much learn and master any skill it takes a certain amount of discipline. When we think of education, there's a discipline required to giving ourselves over to the coursework and, and practicing and reading and studying and remembering and being tested. There's just lots of areas where discipline is required. And so I don't think it should be too surprising that to wake up from a dream of separation that there's some discipline required which I just call mind training, and that it will require some repetition, some practice, some dedication, some devotion, and I would say initially, actually some effort, where is, it's almost like if you were uh, swimming downstream and at some point you were told you have to go upstream like the salmon, uh, it would take some effort. Uh, particularly because it seems like swimming upstream is going against the current. And if we've been so addicted to ego patterns and ego distractions and ego temptations, then to turn away from the ego and to turn toward the spirit can seem to require some effort. And this is only necessary while we still believe that there is something to resist when we get past the stage of resistance, when we get past the stage of, of, of feeling like we're fighting against something, or battling against something, then, then obviously the resistance is gone. We, we actually can see it was never there at all. I studied, uh, I was in university for 10 years and when I came into Course in Miracles, I actually was quite surprised to find that Jesus has a, a positive interpretation of resistance. Because you don't usually hear resistance talked about in positive terms. It's always negative terms. But Jesus says that, the, that resistance is the ego's interpretation of progress and growth. So whenever you feel resistance, just think of those words from Jesus progress 
and growth. Progress and growth are always occurring, and the ego interprets that in a negative way. It interprets itself being undone in a negative way. It wants to exist. It wants to have its own existence separate from the universe, like a uh, wave telling the ocean. It wants to exist independently of the ocean, like a ripple telling the ocean, or like a sunbeam telling the sun. I want to exist apart from the sun. It's, it's really quite arrogant. Sometimes people have described the ego as like a, a mouse roaring at the universe. <laughs> How do we find that one? And so, what we see is that we have a golden opportunity now, as we give ourselves over to this mind training, to actually have a profound change of mind, a profound change of heart that changes everything. It brings us back into a natural state of happiness and joy. And that's our life. Uh, that, that's what we dedicate our life every second of every day to just that. And it's been quite a journey. Maybe you can share a little bit about how it's gone for you, starting off first 15 or so years in Russia, and then another 15 in Canada, yeah, I roughly. Just, I was just thinking, I, would, I wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> where, where to begin. Yeah. Yeah, the truth is, uh, discipline has always uh, has always been part of my life, and has always been part of um, part of my upbring upbringing, in a way. And it's always been um, it was presented to me that yeah, to achieve something you truly want, you're gonna have to practice and uh, and be very disciplined. Um, and I and I felt like. I was open for it. I was very, very open for it. All, all, and I felt like I had potential to really put that discipline and practice and achieve something. My problem was that I never could find some that which would, uh, which, which I would think that it's worth it to put all my heart into it. And I had some interest and. Uh, and they would just like come and go, and even some potentials that I could be potentially good in something. One of those potentials were, were acting and even filmmaking, and it was, and it, and it always came down to a point where I would think, yeah, this is great, but when it came down to, can you commit your life to it? And this, and in terms of, I knew that it was going to take a lot of discipline. Right away, the answer was no. Actually, I don't care for anything that much. And my and and everyone knew that about me, and it was a bit of um, a forgiveness lesson for my family, especially for my mother, because it was like oh, I can't look at this wasted potential. And it was just a reflection in my mind, of course. That it was uh, um, it was being reflected to me that I could. I felt like I was wasting my potential, and uh, and. What do you know? Of course, the miracles came into my life, and it wasn't even a question, and it wasn't even um, it wasn't even personal. Like I felt like something inside me didn't even ask. As soon as I opened it, and it was right away, it just came from me so quickly. This is going to take over all my effort. This is what I'm going to do till the rest of my life. And at a time, I did like I didn't intellectually know what it was, but I felt like this is going to be my priority from now on, and there's nothing else I can possibly take on, because um, I was about to apply for some courses in university, and that, and that was gone from my mind forever. I felt like I wasn't going to have time. This is what's going to be my practice and discipline, and everything is going to come from this study, so to speak, and, and it... And it has been the experience. I felt like, like I said, I wasn't really, I didn't even know at a time what it is that I was signing up for. But uh, later on I discovered that it was presented with a, with a workbook. 
And so that was a good start that I didn't have to walk around kind of like in the dark, how do I practice it? So it, it all came step by step by step by step. And then more and more I came into, I started noticing kind of um, that what I would find out later, I found out that it was called guidance. So that was part of it. And it, it became um, really uh, investing in that more and more and more beyond everything else. And, and then I just watched, um, it wasn't even that gradual, it felt like it was pretty good, quick, everything fall away from my awareness and in terms of everything that was, um, was clearing the way so that everything that was in support of this practice would come my way and then and then uh, shortly after um, when it became very very clear in my mind in a way that this is this is, seems to be the path uh, that I've um, I've relocated from Canada uh, to to the States to Utah and again that was again a way to go deeper into that practice, into practicing, and and the, the interesting thing that as soon as I came to Utah, and at that point I was, you know, I would consider myself probably someone who's has become quite an expert of sorts, that I knew something, um, I've got some ways, as soon as I came to Utah it was again really strong prompt that I have to forget everything I learned now. And again, later on, it, I found out it was just intuitive. It, it would come come in this way that this is part part of A Course in Miracles. This is part of practicing it. This was part of emptying your mind. And it was, in a way, it was like pointing to that state of mind of being clueless. And it was, again, I don't know anything. And it was, I felt a deep desire, actually. Um, I watched a movie that David showed, The Island at a time, and it was inspiring so much that the, for, I, I came out of the session and I felt, I, please help me, I have to forget everything I've learned, I have to start anew with this, with this new context, in this new, in this new way once again, and, uh, and so in that, and the way it was just, yeah, again, back to just everything, <laughs> Applying everything in a way I don't know what anything is for, but you tell me, you interpret everything, you, you, you tell me, and uh, and that that has been the practice, yeah, and then, yeah, like I, because when I came to Utah, it was it felt like I came to a different planet, so the whole setup was made in a way that I was very dismantled. I didn't know what was happening. And it was just, uh, again, back to tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. And we use a lot of um, the practice um, that we use everything for forgiveness. We use everything, um, as I found out later, but I didn't even know at the time. He was just trusting um, everything. Like, in a way, all symbols are used to be forgiven. Everything is to be forgiven. And as I was every time... Uh, as I was stepping into a new task, a new project, it was, I, you know, I didn't know anything about this, but you tell me, you tell me, you tell me, you tell me, and the way, and even a spirit would remind me, my, uh, my, uh, my call was to, uh, like guidance was something that was very, very inspiring to me, and in the end, everything led into that that was the only thing that was supported. That was the only thing that I was uh, coming stronger and stronger and stronger with every every task into listening and hearing in a very deep way in everything. And and no wonder I was put in a situation where I didn't know anything like tech, leading a tech team. I know nothing. I knew nothing about tech, and yet there I was. So it was not going to be accomplished through knowing anything. It was just simple trust and listening and following. And it was everything that would come my way. It was just, but the purpose was to only to stay connected in the spirit and to listen and follow and just be very, very deeply in touch with the guidance. And um, so that, long, like, I guess if I had to summarize it, that would be <laughs> that would be it. That's how. Yeah. That's part of your version.
Yeah. And it's interesting too, right before the scattering started, Tulsi was, we were out in the kitchen area and she was saying, it was very emotional, but it was really like there's a deep, deep seated desire to really come into an experience of what it is like to live from a right-minded state of mind. And a lot of you know that A Course in Miracles is, is a, we could say, a non-dualistic pathway. It's a pathway that points to and leads us to an experience of absolute oneness, of absolute connectedness. Here we are in unity, and this church, even the title of the church is unity. We're coming into an experience of absolute oneness and connectedness, and an awareness that love is all there, there is. It's one step beyond the Beatles, all you need is love, <laughs> to all there is is love. Uh, it's not even a need, but while we're going through the forgiveness process, we're coming in the direction of, we're returning to love, as Marianne Williamson's book talked about, Return to Love. And yet, this state of mind, right-mindedness, that Jesus uses, he juxtaposes it in the Course with wrong-mindedness, saying that, that in reality, there's only love, but while you believe in separation from that love, then I'm going to have to give you a pathway back that teaches you the discernment between being in a, in a tune with Spirit, or aligned with Spirit, and being out of a line. And what wrong-mindedness wrong is, in the, in the most simple way, is the belief in an external cause, in a cause in the world. And that's the thought system that we've all been raised with. That's what the definition of coming to earth is about, to believe that there's something outside of you that can hurt, hurt you or that can help you, that can, something outside of yourself that can heal you or that can make you ill, that can give you life or can take life away, that can, can kill you. It, this whole realm of time and space is the belief that there's something outside. And so basically when we come back and talk about living from right-mindedness, we're coming back to that experience that the mind is, is causative. And I can be hurt by nothing but my thoughts. I could be helped by nothing <laughs> but my thoughts. <laughs> These thoughts are very, very important. So it's very, very important that we get in touch with our thoughts. If, if thoughts are unconscious, if thoughts are judged against and pushed down into the unconscious mind, then you might say, what seems to be our life in this world is more like a robotic acting out of unconscious thoughts and beliefs. So it's absolutely important, imperative actually, for us to become fully conscious of our thoughts. And the reason that thoughts are pushed out of awareness is because oftentimes they've been judged against and they're too terrible, they're too, they're just, just too horrible to be held in awareness. So, you might say that there's a fear in the mind of the power of these thoughts. And why is it that we would be so afraid of thoughts, except that there's a belief in our mind that we could miscreate with our thoughts, that we could go against our source, go against our Creator with these thoughts. That's where the, the terror comes in, that's where the fear comes in. And that's why all of the discipline and the mind training that I talk about is, is coming back to become fully aware and to come into the actual experience that our Source, our Creator, God, never gave us the power to destroy. Never created us with the power to miscreate. It's only this ego belief that brings up this idea of miscreation. God is Spirit and God creates in Spirit. And the Spirit is pure love. So love comes from love. Love extends love. Even in this world we get 
apples from apple trees, we get pears from pear trees, peaches from peach trees, and you might say if we take that back to the realm of spirit, spirit comes from spirit. So the Word of God, here we are down in the Bible Belt, and I, I grew up in the Christian faith and there was a lot of talk about the Word of God. Well the Word of God, I finally got to the point in the course where uh, in the workbook Jesus was talking about the Word of God with a capital W, so I'm kind of interested. Okay fine, tell me what is this Word of God? The Word of God is, I am as God created me. The Word comes directly from God. It's, the, it's our spirit, it's our essence, it's our identity. And Jesus even addresses some things that we've grown up with, uh, because the Bible says the Word was made flesh. And Jesus in the Course in this text addresses this and he says, strictly speaking, this is impossible. The Word, I am as God created me, is, is Spirit. So strictly speaking, he's saying, you can't translate something that's eternal into flesh. And some of you also might remember in the Bible it says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. There was a beautiful uh, monk that lived back in the 12th century named St. Francis. And St. Francis loved the Bible and he loved reading that part. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. And then he followed it up with, I now am born again. Because we, in this day and age, we hear a lot about born again Christians. <laughs> but what does that mean? You know, does it mean you profess faith or belief in Jesus Christ as your Savior? You know, you can see it can come down to like a definition. Are you saved? Have you professed? You know, well, with the Course in Miracles we're starting to realize that this saving, this salvation is more than speaking a few words. Wouldn't that be nice? That's almost as easy as Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, click your heels together three times. There's no place like home, there's no place like home, there's no place like home, and you're back. We're finding that it's more than professing belief of Jesus Christ as Savior. In fact, Jesus, he doesn't shy away from words. I, you know, I know for a lot of Christians that that saved thing is a big deal. Uh, for me, I liked reading in A Course in Miracles that he said, only, uh, only your mind requires salvaging. So only your mind requires salvation. He doesn't talk about souls, you know, how is it big in Christianity, saving souls and saving the lost souls and going out all over the world to save the lost souls and proselytizing Christianity to save the souls. He's not talking about saving souls, plural. He's saying only the mind requires salvaging and it's only salvaged through peace, which makes it really simple. The only way you come back to know your true identity is through forgiveness, which is the salvaging of the mind, remembering your true essence as divine mind, and it's only accomplished through peace. What that does is it says, look around you at the projected time-space world and you may turn on the news and you may have friends that you know, save the animals, save the rainforest, save the, the river and the drinking water up in North Dakota, save the planet, save Mother Earth from pollution, uh, save the world from uh, nuclear proliferation and, and war. You know, we, have, we see a world, we perceive a world where there's all this constant talk about saving some, something. We have certain people are supposed to be saved, certain souls are supposed to be saved, Mother Earth is, should be saved, save the, the atmosphere, save the ozone layer. You know. And everything that's talked about saving, Jesus is saying in the Course, well we can simplify that, it's your mind that believes in separation. Your mind that believes that it's separated from its Creator, that's what needs to be saved. 
He's like saying, let's make this real clear. That's the one thing that needs to be saved, is your mind that believes in separation. Your mind that's sleeping and dreaming of exile from God, that needs salvation. And nothing else needs salvation. Everything that you put all this effort into, in terms of, of the planet, the atmosphere, and, and all the causes, small cause C, with a C, all that is still part of the distraction away from going inside and, and that beautiful teaching, be still and know that I am God. All of those causes, I'll put in quotes, are all a distraction to that. So, it's a very simple direct teaching that basically, not only does Jesus say that the mind that believes in separation needs salvation, but he is also saying that it's already been accomplished. A lot of us were raised with the idea of grace. You know, not through works do we receive salvation, but through the grace of God. Grace has already been accomplished. And that's where it gets simpler and simpler. The more you give yourself over to this thought system, this healing, you start to realize, all I'm really doing is accepting what is rightfully my inheritance. My, my creation, my sense of, of the natural state of mind that I was created in by God. That's all I'm doing, that's all this seeming journey is about, is coming to that acceptance. He calls it accept the atonement, but really coming back into that grace. And I really think that that is what we were beginning to talk about. Tulsi was asking, what is right-minded living like? Because it can't be like a formula, and it can't be that it's going to turn out a certain way, and it looks a certain way. But we can say that we'll feel a certain way. You'll feel happy, you'll feel light-hearted. Uh, here we come all the way down from, from Salt Lake City, down here, and we're staying with Lisa and Peter, and their two dogs' names are Happy and Jolly. <laughs> you see? Now that's, that's what I call the, the beautiful humor of the spirit. Happy and Jolly. When your pets are named Happy and Jolly. And of course, Peter was telling us that about their, their frogs and their dogs, and it, it's, a, it's a long history. This happy and jolly are just the, the most recent <laughs> reflections of love and light. And, and that is what it's so important to come to see, is you have to open to your inner divine guidance. You have to open to intuition. You have to open to that inner alignment and flow, in order to realize who you are. That it's not, there's no amount of past learning, there's no amount of book learning, there's no amount of technical learning, there's no amount of learning in this world that will take us back to the remembrance of who we are. We simply have to come to experience of listen and follow. Because even if you begin to listen to your higher self, your intuitive self, it still won't get you out of this world if you don't follow it. If you are, get these little prompts and nudges and you go, not today, <laughs> or are you kidding me, <laughs> or oh I don't think so, <laughs> you know, where we get into a resistance with our higher self, that's the ego trying to hold on to the status quo. It's trying to hold on to the familiarity. It's almost like if the ego could speak, it would say, uh, thank you Spirit for sharing, but no way. Things are too good already. I'm going to keep things just as they are. And even though they may not be perfect, they're better than most other people have it. That's one of the great devices of the ego, comparison. You've got it good. You've got it better than a lot of others. You should be grateful that you've got it better than others. Really, it doesn't proclaim a loving God at all. Oh, that's great, yeah, some have got it good and some don't. Uh, on our drive over, Peter was saying that was the big issue, life issue was this idea of disparity, the haves versus the have-nots. 
And a lot of times people will say, yeah, that this is a very strange realm where some can seem to have and some not have. And, and would God, would, would love create such disparity? Would love create such differences? Much of the thinking around diversity, I've heard most of my life is, all the way through university and beyond, was um, people kept telling me diversity is a good thing and you need to learn to accept diversity and let's honor all the differences. And uh, I like that word honor, <laughs> I like that word accept, but the only thing was the the diversity, the differences, is really implying not only duality, it's implying multiplicity. It's almost like that was part of a, a discussion of saying, let's just accept multiplicity. And that's actually the ego that sponsors that. Uh, sometimes people would say, well, you know, I'll tell you my truth and you tell me your truth. And she'll tell you her truth and he'll tell you his truth. And can't we just agree to disagree and accept that the truth is different for all of us? My truth may not be your truth. Well, Jesus has a section in A Course in Miracles called the Laws of Chaos. Notice that last word, the Laws of Chaos. And the first Law of Chaos is that the truth is different for everyone. The first Law of Chaos. Jesus is not asking us to accept diversity. He's not asking us to, uh, okay, everyone's different, so just accept the differences. He's basically teaching, we are the same, we are the same <coughs> spirit, we are one mind, we are unified, and differences are unreal. All differences are unreal. Well, if that's the case, if that's the fact of it, then that means comparison has no basis. That means competition has no basis. And most everything is perceived, we'll say, everything perceived through the ego's lens of these differences. And all of the rules of the world, scarcity, lack, competition, survival of the fittest, you know, all the things, uh, winning and losing. Uh, I don't think Deanna follows football, but I was telling her a little bit about the Dallas Cowboys and their record this year with only one loss, and she said, oh, that's, a, that's something good to be forgiven. <laughs> Dallas is having a good year. Deanna said, that, that's good. It's a good thing to forgive. You know, we're taught to use forgiveness on the negative things. We're taught to forgive those years when they were, whatever, four wins and eleven <laughs> losses. You hope, oh, maybe next year, forgive, we'll just forgive that year, but can, can we forgive the good? Can we forgive the positive? Can we forgive those outcomes that the world judges as very good, very well? Because that's actually what it's going to take for us to go to peace of mind. We're going to have to realize that as long as we have these thoughts and beliefs, and we've prejudged what is good and well and right in terms of form, then, then we're going to need to have our minds rinsed of that. The, the judgment is, is not just negativity, judgment is on a continuum, so all positive judgments are equally destructive as negative judgments. Hmm, that's another big one that, you know, I was raised with uh, accentuate the positive, <laughs> eliminate, eliminate the negative, and don't mess with Mr. In-Between. Remember that song? Uh, but none of us were taught to forgive the positive, <laughs> forgive the negative, and forgive everything in between <laughs> as well. Can we forgive the entire continuum of positive and negative? To me, that's the essence of the Course, because what the Course is saying is there's no degree of difficulty, there's no order of difficulty, and there is no hierarchy of illusions. That, that what makes an illusion an illusion is its temporary nature. 
And everything that we perceive of time and space is temporary. It will not last forever. There is no form that will last forever. That's the basis of beginning to open up, to say, okay, you're going to have to show me that. You're going to have to take me into that state of mind. Because that's not human. That's more the being part of human being. <laughs> the human part is the preferences, the judgments, the opinions, all the striving and struggling, and the being part is, is that which God created is perfect. Perfectly loving and innocent, always. Always has been, always will be. So, what we'll be sharing today, and we'll be opening it up to, to, to questions and, and you sharing experiences as well, we will be really looking at the idea of trust. What we are placing our faith and trust in, which I would say is, you could say Jesus, the Holy Spirit, uh, what is required of this development of trust, which I would say is letting go of our past learning, all of our past learning, our past beliefs, our past thoughts, emptying the mind, as Buddhism and a lot of great spiritualities talk about, emptying your mind of everything you think you think and think you know, and opening up to a sense of, of guidance where you feel connected, you feel tuned in, and you will first go from a sense of guidance like there's a higher power or a presence that's guiding you, you as a person, to more of a merge as you go further along where you feel more and more identified as that higher power, at one with that higher power, and then the persona, which is the, the Latin word persona is, is mask, means mask. As you begin to drop the mask of being a separate, unique, individual, autonomous person, as that mask starts to get washed away more and more, you feel this merge with that which has been guiding you. So it's no longer the, the guide, the spirit, and then the person. It's, it's, it all dissolves. That uh, Even the dichotomy between higher self and lower self, or uh, spirit guide and uh, human being, all of that starts to just dissolve away. What will happen? What will become of me? You know, that a lot of people will say, oh my God, that sounds a little scary, what will become of me? Well, you would imagine that you become more consistently happy, consistently joyful, consistently peaceful, and your sense of lack is washed away, your sense of need is washed away, and ultimately a state of complete bliss and contentment take over in your mind for that sense of scarcity and lack and struggle. The scarcity and lack and struggle, that was the ego. Kicking, <laughs> screaming, fighting to be an autonomous entity, an autonomous person. The bliss, the ease, the, the happiness, the joy, that's the natural state of the mind of the Christ, of the living Christ, that is the crea perfect creation of God. So that's the transition we're going through. So what we want to do today is bring that into practicality. Because that's really, I think, what Tulsi was saying, how do we practically live this? What's the way that we practically live this? How can we open to guidance? And is there a way to get in touch, even if there's resistances and fear of that guidance, which I do receive a lot of emails, and that's basically a primary uh, theme of a lot of the emails, is I'm going through a lot of struggles, I really have an intuitive sense that the Spirit's there to help me and guide me, but I seem to be a tough nut to crack, <laughs> or I seem to be <laughs> fighting and kicking and screaming. Maybe it's not as bad as uh, Linda Blair, uh, head spinning in the exorcist and spitting all kinds of things out of the mouth of this. Maybe it's not that bad, but still, there's a bit of kicking going on. Like a bit of, I want to be in charge. I want to still be in charge. I want to still have my hands on the driving, on the steering wheel, or the, the reins of the horse. I want to hold on to that. 
That's the part that takes a great willingness to keep at it, to be persistent. When this ego beast seems to rear up in you that says, I want to be in control. I've been hurt and wounded in the past and I'm never going to let that happen again, so I'm going to take charge. I'm going to take charge of everything. And then that doesn't seem to work so well either, trying to, to be the one driving. It's a good thing. <laughs> good thing. Yeah. So we've got our uh, Rui mic right here. And if anybody has any any questions or topics or themes that, that spring off of what we've just started up with, then uh, we've got our toolsies. We'll bring that mic over so we can record it for everybody. Um, would you elaborate some on forgiving the positive? Um, I know that forgiveness, or I think I understand that forgiveness in the Course is not like what we think of in the, the Christian path of, oh yeah, I forgive you. I don't condone, but I forgive you for what you did. I understand it's something more than that. But if you would elaborate on that some more, I would appreciate it. Yeah. Well, I would say a lot of us have, have come through educational systems where we started to be taught as part of our training was this thing of low self-esteem and high self-esteem. And so most of us kind of said, okay, yeah, they, they, our instructors said it's much better to have high self-esteem than low self-esteem. If you have low self-esteem, you're going nowhere. <laughs> You're just going to be a doormat, you're going to be a victim, you're going to be a castaway if you have low self-esteem. So the goal was to have high self-esteem. And then if we go to the bookstore or to the library and you go through and you get maybe back into psychology, philosophy, education, this and that, you notice a lot of bookstores and a lot of, uh, a lot of libraries and so forth have self-help sections. It's a very big section. Self-help. Well, we need to stop for a moment and say, what, what is the self that needs the help? That's an interesting question. You know, before we get too caught up in all the self-help books and workshops and seminars and we do them for how many, 20, 30, 40 years, you know, oh no, it's, your life, it's a lifelong journey. You need, you need so much self-help, you'll spend the rest of your life decades in self-help. Who is this self that needs the help? Well, actually, let's go back to the idea that, that God created a perfect child, an eternal child, a spiritual child, that's in the likeness and image, we'll say. The Bible said God created us in His likeness and image. Well, if God is spirit, you know, we're, we're kind of getting wise to some of this stuff. We may, we may have looked at the Sistine Chapel, you know, it's a beautiful painting by Michelangelo, but we, we just, we're getting past the idea that God looks like some old man with long white hair. You know, <laughs> that's a little bit superstitious to think. I mean, we like the, the finger touching, you know, thing, that's kind of cool, but it's, it's beyond. Somebody's coming in the front door. You want to, darling, answer our front door there? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Come on in. Oh, we gotta unlock the door. Hello. Well, I'm looking for a, a meeting for. Yeah, come in, please. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> come on in. I drove up from Houston. Very good. You've come a long way. Yeah, yeah I, did. I did. What's your name? Dale. Dale, great. Yeah, I met you a couple times looking canvas. Okay, beautiful. Oh, great. <laughs> I love it. This is like so intimate. Well, my cell phone went out ten minutes out of town. Oh, oh, so nice. beautiful. So and the door, you come and you ring the doorbell. <laughs> and I said, darling, answer the door. And she went, well, some kind of listening for the lesson to this. So. <laughs> That's great. This is our love. 
Welcome to our home down here in Big D. Just welcoming our, our brother from Houston to come in, ring the doorbell here. This is just a good old down home spiritual revival going on here. Nothing but 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 the joy. You gotta know if you come down here though, Dallas is east of here. And this is Arlington. Arlington. <laughs> Fort Worth. Fort Worth. So there's different aspects. Oh yes. 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 Fort Worth and Dallas are like not at all the same. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, comparisons and differences. There we go. <laughs> oh, they're learning. <laughs> Linda's learning. Just learning. Yeah, I'm pretty new here. Yeah. So, we got back to that self-help idea. We were just talking about self-help and the big self-help sections in the bookstores and libraries. And who is the self that needs all this help? And I started off by going into this low self-esteem, high self-esteem. Because we're really getting at the question of... Do we have to forgive low self-esteem and high self-esteem to get back to perfect innocence? Let's just suppose we all were created in perfect love and innocence, and that that self isn't high or low. It's not, it doesn't have an esteem attached to it. It doesn't need esteem. It is what it is. Some of you know uh, Byron Katie's work, Loving What Is. What if God created us as just pure beingness, pure isness, and that essence of who we are is perfect love, perfect innocence, perfect joy. It doesn't have anything to do with low self-esteem or high self-esteem. Because the question that Tulsi was asking right before you came in, you know, was she was asking about, about forgiving the good. What's this thing about forgiving the good? What if good and bad, right and wrong, judged in terms of behaviors and forms, is all part of a continuum to keep us blinded to knowing who we really are. Now, how do you approach this? Well, for instance, I, I was raised in Christianity and uh, went to church, went to Bible school, and I have to say, at some point when I started looking at the Bible, I had one of those Bibles that all the words of Jesus were in red. Anybody ever seen those things? I was like, isn't this great? I, I'm going to cheat. I'm just going to read <laughs> the red words. I like the red words. <laughs> Some of this other stuff, it's a big book. It's pretty twisted sometimes when you try to make sense of some of it. But the red words were always good because for me the red words was like eternity speaking to you. You never find in black, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, that's definitely red words. Definitely red words. Before Abraham was, I am. That sounds like something eternal speaking. That's not a man or a woman. That's not even masculine or feminine. That's, that's eternity speaking. And just supposing that when you read those red words, that that is the Holy Spirit or the voice for God. The voice for eternity speaking to human beings. Drawing us back into eternity. Maybe that's what those red words were about. Well, I started to notice some things about the Gospels, because there's certain things that show up in a lot of the Gospels, but let's just look at something real basic from our daily lives, like positive. You're asking about positive. Forgive the positive. I'm asking about forgive. Forgive. What that, what that really means. Is. Forgive the grudge. Yeah. Yeah. Forgive. And because if you're going to forgive negative, forgive good, I'm still not clear about what that looks like, for lack of a better way of putting mm -hmm. it. Yes. Well, we're going into a state of mind. We could say forgiveness is a state of mind that, that has no judgment in it whatsoever. It's just pure acceptance, pure unconditional love. No judgment at all. No positive judgment, no negative judgment. When I was reading the red words, I would notice that Jesus always had such love emanating, radiating, but he didn't seem to be that interested in the form. He seemed to be more interested in what we call the Beatitudes. He seemed to be teaching the Beatitudes. He seemed to be teaching us a way to live with an attitude that is in alignment with our, our 
heavenly creator. And I also notice things, for example, like for most human beings, we deal with a lot of what I'll call compliments and criticisms. Isn't that part of daily life? I think there's a lot of people pleasing that goes on in this realm, and there's a lot of compliments and criticisms that are, that are tied in, especially the compliments. But I would watch it. Now Jesus, even though he was living with these apostles, 12 apostles, he's like never, hey, James, I like that haircut. Or, hey, Peter, that's a beautiful robe you're wearing. Hey, John, where'd you get those sandals? They're good. You know, we laugh at that because those aren't red words. And yet, we're, we're dealing with black words all the time at work with our spouses, with our, our bosses, with our children. We're dealing with a lot of compliments and criticisms. And it's, it's quite interesting to try to deal with those because the compliments we can say are the positive and the criticisms are the negative. And Jesus was always drawing us into perfect equality, drawing us into a state of mind, drawing us into the grace of God. And so, I would say that's part of answering what this forgiveness is. Also, it's part of addressing your first question, which was kind of like, how, is this, how does it go to live this experience? And what it is, is start to go through a purification of your heart, a purification of consciousness, where you begin to realize that everything you think and say and do teaches the whole universe. Beyond this little body, beyond this little personal self, every single thought, every single word and action is teaching. It's almost like if you are broadcasting and live streaming to the entire cosmos, not just this solar system, but the entire cosmos, that what Jesus was an example of was he was a representation, a demonstration of the highest that we can attain in awareness, which is our natural state of mind. He was a demonstration of that state. We don't see Jesus struggling and, and, and getting into all kinds of conflicts, competitions. We don't see him uh, comparing and contrasting and uh, fighting against we see a presence that's radiating through, which is demonstrating our natural state of mind. And also, with Jesus, he was really a demonstration. A good demonstration is always practical. And yet, even though his ideas were very high, and seemed to be talking a lot about God and the Kingdom of Heaven, his demonstration in terms of form was gentle, was kind was friendly, was open, was loving. All the things we would come to expect from a saint, an avatar, a, a living demonstration of spirit. It's that day-to-day, moment-to-moment, living attitude that, that demonstrates that love. And, of course, the, there is a discernment that's going on as well, because if there are things, thoughts and, uh, and beliefs that are ego-based and ego-driven, they have to get exposed. They have to get um, brought to light. Oftentimes people would say to me, well, you know, I don't know, when Jesus went in the temple and uh, he started you know, letting the birds out of the cages and turning over the tables with all the, where the money was on, that, they said, he looked a little bit angry there, and I said, well, can you imagine somebody who's happy and friendly? It would be like happy and jolly knocking over a table, <laughs> because, because they were demonstrating that, that love and joy and happiness is what it's about, not buying and selling, not commerce in a temple of God. You know, it was, the, it was a demonstration, and it seemed to be an action that involved spilling some tables over and knocking some coins over, but we can't really assume that Jesus was angry when he was doing these things. Mm -hmm. He was just, you might say, proactive for God. But I don't really think we can interpret 
that just because some tables were knocked over and some coins were flying, that Jesus was angry. Because that would go against all of his teachings. Love you one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord thy God. Love and, and anger don't mix. They don't go together. So that's what we're opening to. We're coming to that state of mind where you go through a purification in your own consciousness and then whatever you do, like St. Augustine said uh, famously, love and do what you will. Isn't that a beautiful teaching? Love and do what you will. It, it doesn't proclaim getting into fights over right and wrong and ethics and morality in this world. It's come to the state of living presence of love and then just let your actions flow from that love. I saw our microphone that passed over there. We had the back row there. Okay. Um, I feel like I know the premises of A Course in Miracles, and I believe them, and I want to be there, and I can go along for long periods of time, feeling joy, and calm, and peace, and love, and then all of a sudden I get in, maybe not all of a sudden, but I go through periods of sort of a deep depression at not being able to get there. At, you know, I feel like I, I just don't know where to turn, and it's hard to get that that feeling back. And I'm wondering about some ideas to help me through that. Yeah, yeah, we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. That that reminds me of that uh, old Barry Manilow song, trying to get the feeling again. I've looked high, low. Everywhere I possibly can, but there's no trying to get the feeling again. You know, that we're, we're, we have an experience of lightness and joy, and then when it's, it's gone from awareness, it's like we have an amnesia, and we forget the miracle. You want to share anything about that? I think so. A little bit. Hmm. Yeah, uh, in my experience, as it turned out to be, uh, where there seems to be a contrast, like everything, uh, finally there's that experience, it seemed to be that, that it, the experience is given that I didn't even know that I was um, calling forth, and then you can even call it an experience, what I would call a happy dream. And it would last, and everything is just absolutely, the feeling was that um, I'm just in love with the whole, and the whole is in love with me, and everything is absolutely perfect. Everything works together for good, it's not, nothing depends on the outcome, it's, it's an experience of that state of mind. And then, boom, gone. And, and next thing I know, I'm in the place where that's not the experience at all. And and so it felt so that that was confusing for me for a while, and it came down that um, the answer for me was that there's some deeper filters that are in the unconscious that have to be forgiven, that have to be brought to to the light to be forgiven. And so, especially if it's so obvious that okay, it doesn't, it's not consistent. And so instead of just staying with that. What, what felt like a heartbreak and I've lost something and it would just be, uh, it became more and more, it turned into an inspiration and I would be back into, okay, now it's time to just listen and follow again and trust and I do not know my best interest and of course the most perfect, uh, uh, most perfect things would be given to me to again, listen and follow and practice and uh, of course, underneath it all, it would be um, healing. Um, what is truly, what is uh, to get in touch? What is it that needs to be healed and forgiven and the unconscious beliefs? And of course, there's gentleness to it. I always uh, advocate that it's not about digging. It is really f listening and following. And then it d the unconscious beliefs do um especially um, in the past, I think 2015 was dedicated to that in my life, I can say it, 
directly and it was dedicated because um, it felt like it happened a few times where there's the happy dream and then there isn't. <laughs> and so I've committed consciously, I said, okay, what would it take for me to go all the way to the consistency? And uh, I prayed and prayed and it came down to just, okay, there's some um, something that needs to be forgiven and then I've committed to it in the way that uh, <clears throat> that it wasn't, it was, I don't know how long it was going to take, maybe the rest of my life, but I've, like, I've received that experience, so I knew it was real, so it's, it can't be lost, and so therefore I was just committed to go, like, I don't know the way, you give me the way, and uh, part of it, and it was consistent, I would just, um, a lot of stuff, came to my awareness that I did uh, that I didn't know about that or that I was even surprised I thought I've healed it before and it was a uh, long story short it's all it's nothing it's, it's nothing mysterious it's all the belief in lack and unworthiness uh, uh, unworthiness and lack abandonment so it's nothing mysterious but then it's one thing to say unworthiness but then to be able to really get down to the core and even see how I started linking the mind started linking it that every upset has uh, was the core of that and so and then and then uh, I was given a function to begin with it was a, the administrator for the admin and uh, but that was the purpose of it, to really get in touch, like to get in touch very deeply with everything that doesn't support the, that experience. And so, and then um, after, I don't know, after a while, I don't know how long it's been, then I started to notice a shift. And so, um, so that, I guess that would be, if that makes sense, that would, that it would, does, that would I, be my answer. Is there no end to these blocks? Um, these things that keep arising, um, like you said, over and over again, oh, there's that one again. I keep saying to myself, which is fine, but sometimes I it's so thick that I can't I can't get out of the depression that I feel because that has happened again to me. And it doesn't appear to be from anything that's happened outside. It just arises. In my experience there is the end, although there is I like a uh, I, at a time I said, I don't know how long it's going to last, it's not a quick fix, but then there is, when, when you make that prayer and, and you even say, I don't know, lead me, I don't know what it would take, I don't know how it's going to get healed, there's that relief in it and the most, uh, most supportive tool or the next step is given and, you know, and there's awareness of the purpose for it. There is that sense of inspiration and ignition, although it's not necessarily, oh my God, I'm ignited and I'm back. And so there is that trust and ignition. I could always feel through the whole, uh, during that whole time, what I would, uh, yeah, like, like, like oh, if I forgot that, but I, I remember referring to it as a dark year. But there was also always that underneath it all that sense of ignition, and I heard myself talking about being ignited, even within that, knowing what it's for. And uh, and of course, there's I um, I talk. I think I've mentioned a lot in the past uh, few weeks about accepting the tools. It's not about stagnating in it, and uh, even to get in touch with the like what is it underneath it all with the beliefs like. There, there's a tool, like we have a tool, it's called Instrument for Peace and uh, Levels of Mind uh, dot com, Instrument for Peace, this can come in very, very handy and then, and then also from there on um, anything that like come, comes comes your way and then there's always, I feel like there's when there's a, a real prayer of I don't know lead me. I don't know, but you know, but uh, I'm committed to walking through this the way you would have me walk through it. So, something comes in very clearly when there's that awareness and knowing this is what it's for. And if and it's just following that step. So I find that they're absolutely crucial. Otherwise, it's just as an end, as an end. But in that way, 
there is already a sense of recognition as, as that step is taken. So, yeah. Yes. Oh. Do you have a comment on that? Yes, I... Which do you... Okay, who was it that has the depression? Is it you? Mm-hmm. Um, well, depression is sometimes caused by anger. So, my question to you would be is part of that that you feel angry at yourself? I'm sure that's all it is. It's that why can't I progress, you know, make, why can't I get there? Well, then my question to you is have you forgiven yourself? You know, when this happens, Probably. what you can do is recognize that you're being really hard on yourself and that you're trying to, you know, your expectations of yourself are very high. High, and then take the time, just as you forgive everyone else, the whole world, and, you know, all the practice that you do, take some practice to forgive yourself and see if it goes away. Yes, and there's a beautiful line from the Course where Jesus says, uh, whenever you feel the need to become defensive about anything, you have identified yourself with an illusion. So it's a beautiful reminder again to that the truth doesn't need forgiveness. The I amness doesn't need forgiveness. Spirit doesn't need forgiveness. Forgiveness is for illusions. And the truth is beyond forgiveness. You might say that forgiveness leads toward the truth, but the truth doesn't need forgiveness. It's the sleeping mind, it's the mind that is bought into separation and, and given, trying to give life where there is no life. That's the, that's the mind that is going through a, the healing process. And so, it is helpful to, as Linda was saying, to bring it back to self, because really everything is about identity. You start to realize that all upsets are always about identity. They're never, as he says in lesson number five in the workbook, I'm never upset for the reason I think. That's such a helpful lesson, because it's like, oh yeah, dislodge from this whole story, this whole justification, this whole mental vice of, of proving somebody wrong, or blaming yourself even for, how could I have done that? How could I have been so stupid to do that? You know, it's really letting yourself out of that vice. And sometimes people would say, well what happened after you did the workbook and everything? And I said, well there was a time where I would just go happily along my way, like you were saying, lots of joy and happiness, and when a trigger would come, or an upset would arise, I would, I would just use those early workbook lessons, five, six, seven, eight. I would always go through five, six, seven, eight with myself whenever I started to get upset. I'm, a five is I'm never upset for the reason I think. Six is I'm upset because I see something that's not there. Seven, I see only the past. And eight, my mind is preoccupied with past <coughs> thoughts. Well that helps, because instead of getting off into justifying, like, can you believe what they said, I can't believe, did you see that look on their face and that I can't believe, well, if I see them the next time, you know, I'll let them, you know, it's this ego wants to go all revved up to justify the fear, justify the anger. And Jesus comes out clearly in the Course and he says, anger is never justified, and then in the next paragraph, he has a line at the beginning of the paragraph, it says, pardon is always justified. We were having that discussion, we were having dinner last night, we came up to those words, never and always. And we all laugh because, oh, they get tossed around, you know, all the time on planet Earth. You know, the love songs, I will always love you, Whitney Houston, uh, or the never word comes in, but actually, when Jesus says, anger is never justified, he's saying, if you could go honestly into your mind, you would see you have no basis for anger. It's always some kind of error or distortion that's trying to get a hold of your mind whenever you get angry. And pardon or forgiveness is always justified. 
And it's always a gift to yourself. It's not really a gift to anybody else. You're always letting yourself off the hook. You're letting your, your small self be released and coming back to that wholeness and that magnitude. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Okay, I don't really, well I guess I do not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with what you just said, um, like when you see, when you, you have the awareness of what you're doing, and you have, um, like I'm going through a process right now, and I've been going through purification processes, but um, it's like, I, I need you to be guilty. You know, when you see, and because your identity, and you even see that it's your identity so wrapped up, that you're so much, ter- you're like terrified of the truth, um, or allowing that love. I mean, it's like, how do you really get past that that terror? Is it just a matter of just, is it a surrender? I mean, do you get to that process of surrender? I, mean, I don't know. Um, I can just think of there's, you know, a couple of people that I'm just like hanging on to their guilt, even though I see it's myself. Um, and I see that my identities are wrapped around it and everything. And I just don't want to let it go because the terror is like, you know, I need, it's like I see, at times I think about it when you talk about the death wish. I think about, it's like, I need to be guilty, you to be guilty so God won't come after me. It's like, I think it's like that heavy and grain that I deserve to be punished, and but I need it to be you, so it's not me. Um, and it's like, how do you get to that core how do you break through that core yeah. um, belief that no, it's really God that does love you, and that's all there really is, and you just surrender to those um, of wanting to hold anybody guilty, even when, like I said, that's the part that's like I can see past that it's not them and it's me or whatever, and I could process it through my, but just to emotionally just surrender. Um, so just I'm asking you know, what do you do when you how do you just really open up and let that love come into you yeah thank you for sharing that yeah. for opening up with that it's like a lot of friends that I've known over the years who've been gone through the 12 step programs um, once they get kind of past the, the surface addiction to whatever whether it's food or alcohol or drugs or sex whatever it seems on the surface and they start to do their inventories, they start to go a little deeper and deeper into the mind, they start to encounter what is called in the blue book, uh, the stinking thinking. You know, once they get through all these behaviors and memories and, oh my gosh, it's just been horrific and I'm an addict and all this and this, and they start to, to expose all that, and I think also they're surrounded by others who are exposing too, which starts to give them a little bit of a feeling like, wow, I'm not the only one I thought I was the, the worst creature on earth. <laughs> and there are others that are reflecting this same addiction. Then we get down to the stinking thinking. And, and I would say that from A Course in Miracles perspective, what's under that guilt, guilty thinking, what's under that even attraction to guilt, Jesus has a subsection in his book called Attraction to Guilt, is this belief, ultimately that the belief that I can create myself. So, you know, we, we're exposed to so many ideas and a very popular uh, New Age idea is uh, you create your own reality. Um, that's very popular. And that's not the teachings of A Course in Miracles. The Course doesn't teach that at all, actually. It's, it's basically teaching that God is the creator of reality, and you can only, at most, accept the reality that God created for you. You, as, as a co-creator even, are creating in spirit with God, but co-creation doesn't have anything to do with this world of time and space. Not creation or co-creation has nothing to do. So there's enormous distortions that, that come in where you try to mix creativity with this world. We think of 
painters as creative, we think as musicians as creative, we think of dancers as creative, we think of uh, uh, inventors, you know, inventing new things all the time. We say, oh, they're very creative, you know, if they could. Uh, poets, we think of creative and so on and so forth. So, of course, the miracles is coming along and say, well, actually, creation is spirit, creation is love, creation is light, and there's an addiction and an attraction to guilt, and if we follow the roots down deep enough, it's all based on one idea, which is, I can create myself. Instead of, in the workbook, I am as God created me. Now the ego will jump on this one helpful idea that releases uh, the Son of God to, to be the Christ, which is, I am as God created me, and it will say, oh come on, you don't have to settle for that. Uh, you can be the top creator. You can take that away, you can usurp, you can steal that function away from God, and you can be the, the top creator. And you, Jesus almost has an antidote for that in, in the workbook, where he actually has a workbook lesson where he says, I choose the second place to gain the first. It's a very interesting workbook lesson. In fact, it reminds me a lot of the Bible where Jesus would say things, the big, the, here we are with the red letters again, why do you call me good? Only God is good. You see, Jesus was always pointing back to the source, toward, toward the Creator. Always, always, always pointing at the Creator. In humbleness, because he was saying, if you've seen the Father, you have seen me. You know, he basically, he was sharing that the Christ and God are one in spirit. But it's extremely humble, and whenever you try to bring the personal in, take personal credit for anything, believe that you personally have done something great or well, you go for personal attention and so forth, it misses the mark. The humility is gone. It's back to putting faith and, 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 and strength and attention on the ego. So the spiritual journey is one in which you have to have great allowance and willingness, and those are, you're describing very ar articulately the the shaky moments where there's a fear of love. You know, it, at first it starts to acknowledge that, like, whoa, I, I always thought I loved love. And then you start to face this thing of fear of divine love. And it's the ego's fear, it's not our, our fear, but it's the ego's fear of, of annihilation, of, of being dispelled, being dissolved. It, it, the ego knows there's something above it but it doesn't know what that something is. So it's, it's always fretting, it's always concerned, it has anxiety, it has concern. Ooh, I gotta be careful, gotta be careful. It's, it's quite afraid of being undone, and yet that undoing is inevitable. It doesn't even like that word, it's like ooh, it doesn't like the word inevitable, because that's the, that's the destiny that, that everything, everyone is fulfilling to come to that. So, when you have those points, when you start to feel that fear, it's always good to, to take that pause, to relax, to take a deep breath, and in, what you're doing is you're, you're facing that, that fear of love. It's only the anticipation that is where the, the fear is. When we relax and surrender, then we open to that experience, we open to that experience of grace. And, and that is what convinces us, it's that actual experience. People have asked me about that same question in regard to not so much um, guilt, but in regards to like sickness, they'll say, uh, well from what I'm hearing, you know, you're teaching that sickness is a decision, and they say, who in their right mind would choose to be sick? And I said, there you go, you got it. <laughs> no one in their right mind would choose to be sick. Sickness is always a wrong-minded decision. Sickness is always a decision based in fear, scarcity, guilt, and it's trying to draw forth a false witness. So, in this world we seem to be able to draw forth those false witnesses of, of frailty, fatigue, 
sickness and so forth. But the higher court, we could say, the Holy Spirit dismisses the case every time. No matter how, uh, how we build a case, no matter how many details we fill in, no matter how full and, our, and, and specific our case is, it's like going before the, the judge, the Holy Spirit, and, and there's, there's no judgment at all. It's like, gavel down, case dismissed. Well, I spent years building that case, and you're just going to dismiss the case without even hearing it? Yes, case dismissed. That's a beautiful reminder that, that it's, it comes down to that. In the end, we, we have to let go of, of thinking that these cases these uh, false evidence appearing real, you know, that those are actually capable of, of, of limiting us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> oh, it's, it's break time. Diana, yeah, and Peter's got everything ready in there. The table is ready with snacks. So we'll, let's take about, a, maybe about a 25 minute break. And uh